All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Rose, CTO here at OpsLevel, and today we have Paul Osmond. Paul is a staff platform engineer at Honeycomb. Previously, he was a senior engineering manager at Under Armour, where he led a lot of their infrastructure teams and pretty much all things Kubernetes and microservices. Uh, before that, he led platform teams at Pagerty and SoundCloud, and now is leading a platform team at Honeycomb. I got to have the opportunity to work with Paul at Pagerty. He also has an adorable daughter and is the author of Microservices Development Cookbook. So Paul, thanks for being here, man. Thanks so much for having me, Ken. Happy to be here. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, you know, when you started at Honeycomb, you started as um, their lead telemetry engineer. Uh, what does that kind of mean at Honeycomb? Like what are the, what were some of the things that you worked on? Yeah, for sure. So interestingly enough, when I started at Honeycomb, there was no telemetry team. That's really where the lead title comes from. I came on board, bootstrapped the team. Eventually we hired a manager, we hired a product manager, work in that area. We hired four other engineers and I've since moved on to join the platform team. So in the early days, uh, before I joined, SDKs, libraries, all of the things that you would use to get data into Honeycomb were managed by engineers across the, the company. You know, different engineers just out of the goodness of their hearts were maintaining libraries in different languages like Ruby, Go, Python, Java. So really my job was to kind of come on board, figure out, you know, what were we going to continue to support? What was our strategy in the long term for, you know, client libraries and SDKs? And then how are we going to build a team around supporting that? So I helped, you know, with other folks in the company, like Liz Fong Jones, we helped kind of formulate the strategy with regard to open telemetry, which is a big industry community mm -hmm. standard on telemetry data and really just kind of, you know, helped bootstrap the team over the first 18 months that I was at the company. Nice. So it sounds like um, almost like leaving up an integrations team, like, like figuring out for all these various sources that could send data to Honeycomb, just how to make it easier to get that data into Honeycomb. Yeah. And that's exactly how we described our charter is, you know, we were there to make getting data into Honeycomb as easy as possible. We wanted to meet customers wherever they were. So, you know, we made obviously open telemetry and made our own client SDKs that made it easy to put instrumentation into your code, but also integrations that would, you know, take your logs from whatever application or infrastructure you're using and ship them off to Honeycomb. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about uh, open telemetry. Yeah, for sure. So open telemetry is one of those great stories where in open source or in open standards, two communities recognize that they're serving the same audience and then decide to actually combine their efforts. So open telemetry specifically grew out of the open census and the open tracing projects, which were, you know, two different projects with very similar goals, which was to create an open source ecosystem around telemetry data, specifically tracing metrics and logs in these cases. So it's a CNCF project, hundreds of contributors. I think it's, I, I once heard that it was one of the most active CNCF projects, which is really cool, just in terms of the diversity and the number of, of right. contributors. Kubernetes is probably like like the first one and then you know exactly. open telemetry is like a close second exactly and so um what open telemetry is producing are two main categories of work one is a specification that describes how telemetry data should look and the other is a set of open source APIs like an SDKs that allow you to actually easily generate that telemetry data from your systems. So, you know, like I said, Honeycomb are really big fans of this. We have kind of jumped in with both feet. I, I've joked in the past, and it's not really joking, I kind of dream of a future where thanks to efforts like this, Telemetry is not something that engineers think a lot about. Whether you're using a web framework or a mobile framework or whatever, you just kind of have telemetry baked into your framework. And I'm really, really hopeful that, you know, through efforts like this, we can get closer to a world like that. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it, it's making it vendor agnostic as well. So that way, if you want to use Honeycomb or you want to switch to Datadog or New Relic, because everybody's using the same protocol and the same standard, it, it gives kind of engineers more choice about what vendor they're actually going to use. Exactly. And in fact, one of the use cases I've pointed to in the past is using a product called the Open Telemetry Collector you can actually fork off and tee off your telemetry data. So if you are, for instance, interested in evaluating multiple vendors or even continuing to use, let's say, an open source product internally like Jaeger, maybe you have some teams that are just really used to that UI, but you also want to evaluate a vendor, then you don't have to change any of your telemetry in your application. You just change your configuration of your pipeline using the, the collector. And that's super powerful because I, I think one thing that we've learned in this world is that instrumenting your code, it's debt. It's not, you know, work that any customer particularly cares about. We do it for ourselves. And so re-instrumenting your code is just a non-starter for a lot of people. You know, right. if you have hundreds of services and you've instrumented it, you want to do that once, not every time you evaluate a new vendor. 
Right, you have to go rip out some library, put in some new one, uh, change a bunch of call sites to do something. It's not going to happen, you know, yeah. unless you figure out a way to bake it into RPC libraries or something like that, which, you know, most organizations are not at the level of homogeneity that they can kind of do that in their environments. It, exactly. I really like what you were saying about, you know, it, it's almost like establishing a protocol. Like most people don't think when they have to make a request, it's like, okay, I'm going to make an HTTP request. That's just the standard we're all going to use. And this sounds highly similar. Yeah, not that it would be a desirable outcome necessarily, but there's nothing stopping there from being forks or competing open telemetry compatible libraries, right? You know, that just exist outside the, the core community. I wouldn't see that as desirable, but it's certainly possible. And right. that's a good thing. Now, one of these you mentioned around telemetry, you use the triad, I call it, right? The metrics, logging, and tracing. And for a long time, those three words were also equivalent to observability. And recently, there's been this kind of shift in, in taking observability back to its like original definition from like control systems about like, well, it's about measuring internal state of how your system is doing. How does Honeycomb kind of think about that conversation around observability? Yeah, for sure. So I won't represent Honeycomb because uh, I work for charity majors who can do that much better than me. Okay, fair. How does Paul uh, charity has, think about that? Yeah, exactly. Like charity has written extensively about this and is one of the earlier people certainly to start using the term observability. And her definition definitely came from control theory, which as you said, I'm going to probably you know do this no justice, but it's kind of the idea that a system is said to be observable if you can evaluate its state without modifying it. You know, so if you can kind of look at without going in and instrumenting specifically, if you can just get the data and say, oh, you know, here's what's going on, then then it's observable. The way I sort of see this is the whole logs, metrics, traces thing came out of, in my opinion, it just came out of that's what we had, you know, and mm. that that's often the case with this stuff, right? Like if you have a just a binary, like a Linux process, and it has no instrumentation in it that you're aware of. What you have at your disposal are, you know, Linux debugging tools. You have S-Trace, right. you have, yep. you know, whatever EBPF else. EBPF now is, is all the hot rage. Exactly. You know, and this is very low level and this is very, you know, systems dependent. And that's great if that's what you have. If you can get a little higher level, you know, let's say get some logging output or something like that, you'd probably welcome that. Similarly, you know, as this sort of world evolved, in my experience, at least, we started using metrics for everything. I've used metrics in anger. I've had like <laughs> frameworks where we incremented a counter every time a certain path was executed or something like that. And I, I think many of us have been in those shops and, you know, it, it worked to some extent. What's, what's um, the quote? It's like when you, when you have a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. Right. And, and, you know, at this point, a lot of shops lived in worlds, like a lot of companies lived in worlds where there were only hammer stores, you know, like where there yeah. were just weren't that many things out there. And so that's how I think of the logs tracing metrics thing. Like, I really don't like this world where companies are selling you this idea that, oh, if you have all three, you have observability. No, you have data, right? Like how well that data represents the internal state of your system is really the degree to which you have observability. Mm -hmm. And so how does Honeycomb kind of fit in this? Like I know Honeycomb has been championing a lot, like we kind of transcend all three because we're all about events <laughs> and high card now, but can you talk a little bit about how Honeycomb differentiates itself in terms of yeah. this? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you said it, Honeycomb at its heart is a ultra wide event store. And what I mean by that is I kind of love it because you see people's eyes like kind of light up once it flips on for them, you know, it can kind of see, you know, see the, the forest for the trees now and everything, but we just accept, you know, keys and values and you can embed those. You can have as many of them as possible. And you, so you have an ultra wide table that represents your data mm -hmm. uh, in a particular data set is what we call them in Honeycomb. And, you know, that's how we started. And the inspiration for Honeycomb back in the day was Scuba, a tool used internally at Facebook. We figured out along the way that what are traces, if not events that have trace IDs that you can group by, they have parent IDs. So if a trace is a child span, it can refer to the ID of a span that is its parent mm -hmm. and each you know event has its own id a span id if you have those three things and then you have duration that represents you know how long this individual span took then you've got a tracing system mm -hmm. so you know really that's where we've sort of said you know like for us it's not about like logs metrics or traces it's all of that stuff it's it's just data right, right? and it's how you represent that data is really the question using honeycomb i'll say the biggest difference i see with people when they get it is we encourage a flow where you're iteratively asking lots of questions about your data. So you, you know, you see people get their data into Honeycomb in this ultra wide table format. They just keep adding fields. I've often joked, like we have this alert that goes off internally when a customer gets to 10,000 columns in a data set, we start to ask like, did they misconfigure something? Right. But, and then we might reach out to them to say, Hey, did you misconfigure something? But you know, that number is pretty large, right? Like 10,000 columns. Cause we just don't care. Our 
data store is built with this in mind and it's not a concern to us. Same thing with cardinality. You know, customers routinely will by accident do a group buy on a, you know, field like a unique field. Right, like some and ID or, or something. It just like means that. the query yeah. takes a long time. You know, like that group buy is going to be an expensive query. We might get some low urgency alerts on our side if it's a really big customer on a really big data set, but really it's not a big deal. But for the average customer, you know, you don't have to worry about putting something like a user ID in a data set and then grouping by that. You can do that. You can group by several dimensions and it really doesn't matter. So it's almost like you have this arbitrary key value store. You can do group buys all the way. And then you realize... Oh yeah, we can build the tracing tool on top of this and maybe anything else you want to as well. Metrics as well. We uh, yeah. recently released metrics and like that's an approach that Honeycomb has taken to these things is we didn't just, you know, take a time series database and bolt it on and like say, okay, you can add metrics now. We wanted to figure out like, how do we reuse this model, but with metrics in mind. And so, you know, we're really, if you look at the way that we've implemented metrics, it's very much done in a Honeycomb way. We think it's centered around what questions do engineers want to ask when they're, you know, using our tool? And so for metrics, for instance, you want to, you know, there are times where you want to know this was happening from a customer perspective, what was happening on the system, you know, in terms of CPU usage or disk usage or whatever, you know, it is that you're interested in tracking GC cycle, you know, GC mm -hmm. statistics, whatever. It's interesting as you're talking about this kind of mode that your users go through where they kind of uh, iteratively ask questions of Honeycomb. I think about our own usage internally at Ops level where, you know, we use a metrics provider and it's more, you kind of have to know a priori the questions you're going to want to ask and then emit those metrics then. And so then you can, you know, you have beautiful dashboards, you can see all the metrics, but you can't really, it's hard to poke beyond what's there. Yeah, exactly. And that's totally not the world I want to live in when I'm debugging an incident, right? Like yeah. an outage. So a, a typical like honeycomb, you know, use case will be something like, I don't know, you get a pager duty alert that you have an SLO that's at, you know, risk of being missed. That pager duty alert will come from our triggers program, which integrates with, you know, pager duty. You go and you look at the, you know, a heat map that shows you your SLO and it shows you that duration is way high, you know, so your, your latency is way up. There's a feature in Honeycomb called bubble up, which allows you just to circle that like high latency portion of that heat map. And then we're going to show you for every field in your data set, the sample that you selected versus the population. So in other words, like, Hey, everybody who's experiencing high latency is also in this AWS region. Okay, now let's zoom in there and let's ask more questions. Like, is it a particular service in that region? Oh, it's everything that's talking to Dynamo. You know, and I'm not pretending that Dynamo had an outage in a region or something like that, but those are the never. types of uh, things. Dynamo would never go down. No, ever. Of course. No. But those are the types of questions and the types of journeys that customers go on. And one of my favorite, you know, anecdotes about working at Honeycomb is we do this onboarding where, you know, we give new engineers, new employees, like a tour of the product. And every time someone does it, we use our own data sets to kind of, you know, show off how, how we use Honeycomb. We always find something, you know, we always like in the process, we're like, oh, there's like these child spans here that, oh, let's look in that, further. That and, shouldn't be like that. Like what's going on there? Exactly. Like we, we've jokingly called it like, you know, mean time to WTF, right? Like how long before, yeah. And, and it's also a thing I've witnessed with customers when they first get their data in, they're like, wait, it's doing that. And, and that's the kind of stuff we want because it's a joy to engineers to go and find out like, oh my gosh, we're doing, you know, this, this many times and we don't need to be. And then they go and fix things and, you know, it starts to work much better. So it is about that exploratory thing rather than asking the questions you already knew to ask, like, you know, is latency high? That's a really, really early jumping off point for us for Discover. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about some architectural stuff. I kind of always think of like, what's the coolest architecture you've ever worked on? I remember, you know, in a previous conversation, you and I have talked about like Honeycomb's own architecture for, I think it was query evaluation and like some ridiculous uses for Lambda. That might mm -hmm. not be the coolest thing you've seen, but it definitely yeah. is one of the cool things I have. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that or, or just the coolest architecture you've seen. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll keep going with that one because it's fresh in my mind. Because <laughs> uh, I actually, I'll come back to this in a moment. I don't think that there is such a thing as cool or uncool architecture. I think it's just whatever works. And one a of the things I really, yeah. one of the things I really appreciate about Honeycomb and the way we've built systems so far is that it's all pretty boring. Our system is not that complicated. We have a few services. We we name things after dogs. The legal name for our company is actually Hound Technology. So, you know, we have Retriever, which is our thing that a startup should never do. We built our own custom Collular data store um, that stores events. Shepherd is what accepts those events. And so you may pick up on the fact that, you know, the dogs are named for the roles, you know, retrievers right. fetch things, shepherds. 
Bassett is our trigger system. Okay. Uh, Beagle is a relatively new system we built for uh, SLO management. But the point is, you know, I can probably name these all and, you know, I'd still have one hand up, you know, like listing them off. You know, we haven't, you know, exploded into hundreds of microservices or anything like that because we've just kind of built things as we needed them. One of the most interesting things about our architecture to me, you hinted at this, is when we started looking at Retriever, our data store, we, the way Retriever works very roughly is, you know, segments are stored on disk. And so a segment represents a certain number of events. Those segments are eventually shipped off to S3. And that's how we can, you know, make sure that you have a certain amount of data, you know, in your on disk and a certain amount of data that's on S3. It used to be that queries were just really slow when you, when you went back in time because we had to go to S3. Nowadays, we, we sort of, this was, you know, going back to around the time I joined, this was already uh, in progress, but we, we actually just, when you, you know, make a query, you specify your query window. If that query window spans what's on disk and what's on S3, we spin up a whole bunch of lambdas as a way of retrieving those S3 segments in parallel and then combining the results. And so the query is still ridiculously fast. What's kind of nice about it is you think about like elastic scalability, and, you know, the, the auto scaling is very cool, but auto scaling is, you know, usually you get more capacity about a minute and a half or five minutes after you asked for it, right? After right. you needed it. With Lambda, we're able to just use it as like, you know, not actually infinitely, but pretend it's infinitely scalable CPU. It's just right. like, I want a whole bunch of, you know, processes to spin up and start doing work. And I want it to be like by the millisecond. And so that was really innovative, I thought, and a really neat uh, use of Lambda. Yeah, so, I think yeah, that's, that's the one that stands out in my mind. It's less using it. I mean, it's for compute, but the actual computational part is really small. It's more just for the elasticity and the fact that like, you just have a, AWS gives you a lot of servers. We need a Lambda. lot of parallel things happening at yeah. once at one time. And it can be a lot of parallel things, you know, such that spinning up a bunch of VMs or even containers might just not be feasible in that, in that time. Yeah. Something I, whenever uh, I think about Lambda, I always think like, oh, the cold start problem, but you know, uh, that's only a few seconds of latency. You know, if you have to first spin up a container, mm -hmm. I guess that's nothing though, compared to, to your point about like, oh yeah, if I had to spin up a VM, uh, that'd be minutes. So like yeah, a few exactly. seconds is nothing. Um, oh yeah. Ha have you folks had to like do any optimizations around cold start things with respect to Lambda? Uh, no, we just make sure that queries are always happening. That's fair. <laughs> That's yeah, I guess like so it's and always so, the cache is always warm. Exactly, and uh, you know, like you said, in the case that you do pay a penalty, it's a pretty minor penalty in the span of of the actual computation. So no, we haven't had any, had to do anything there. The other point that you mentioned though, like the startup time for VM is something that we started to evaluate. So, you know, we have increasingly, obviously we're growing. That's a really great thing. It also means that, you know, more customers are sending us more data and in a more spiky format too. And so traditionally we've, we've depended on, you know, ASGs to scale up our ingest service and we use Chef for configuration management. And we got to a point where, you know, our bottleneck was really provisioning the VM and, you know, running the first boot. So now we're getting to a point where we're starting to evaluate Kubernetes and containers as a way of, you know, reducing that scale up time. So it's not so much, you know, using Kubernetes because we have tons of microservices that need managed. It's more like we need things to scale up really quickly and, you know, requiring a EC2 instance to, you know, be provisioned and then requiring a chef run is just taking, you know, way too long for us. Right. That's like actually a great segue because Kubernetes, you know, is taking over the software world, right? Like it's a software's thing. eating the I world. It's like, here to stay. Yeah, you know, like yeah. it kind of it kind of won the the scheduling race. You know, like totally. there was Nomad, yeah. uh, Mesos kind of and DCOS threw in the towel. They're like, fine, well, we're, we're, we're a Kubernetes chef also, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Kubernetes kind of won. And I feel, this is my take, Kubernetes has great marketing behind it, but I kind of feel mm -hmm. it's this big foot gun, right? Like yeah. I come from the Rails world, right? Where it's all about convention over configuration. There's a bunch, of, a sane set of defaults so that if you follow this path, you're set to go. And Kubernetes feels like the opposite. It's like, well, here's a bunch of primitives, go, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Build what you want, but we will not dictate how. And so everybody kind of does it a little bit differently. What are some guiding principles that you think about when organizations should think about adopting Kubernetes or when it might be too early for them or when it might be too late? Yeah. Well, I, I think I hinted at it earlier when I said the thing that makes an architecture, my favorite architecture is that it's simple. And so Kubernetes, like you said, is in that place where it has won the orchestration wars. You know, I remember at Under Armour when we first started looking at like moving to something like Kubernetes, 
we were doing bake-offs and all of this sort of thing, like figuring out like which was the right solution for us. And there was a bit of analysis paralysis. And, you know, eventually somebody was like, the question's been answered for us, you know, by the open source community mm -hmm. and by all these companies moving to Kubernetes. In terms of customers, like evaluating whether it's the right time or not, you have to assess like, what's the need? And this is something that engineers can either be really good at, or they can be really bad at. You know, sometimes we really do like to jump on the new and exciting things, but if the old and well-known thing is still working for you and it's not a limiter, it's not a bottleneck, then why would you change it? Mm -hmm. Unless you have a group of engineers who are all really good with Kubernetes already, it's what they're able to do fastest and it's what they're able to, you know, get running with the most smoothly and they can train new engineers to use this. Why would you do it? So, right. Like I mentioned with us, you know, Honeycomb's been around for about five, six years now. And, you know, we're now looking at it as a possible way to, you know, increase the speed of our scale-ups. So but it's with that, a specific problem in mind that you're... you're it it became, our old setup became a limiter. You know, that's, that's really what it became to for us, because we're going to have to explore like, what is the right way to set up Kubernetes for us? And, you know, I, I am heartened that nowadays there are very few companies, unless you're of a certain size where you're going to look at actually setting up your own clusters with something, well, you know, I, I don't know what the newer tools are, but like cops, you know, was the thing. Mm -hmm. But nowadays I'm really glad that, you know, you're pretty much going to go with your cloud provider, you know, yeah. whether you're on Azure or Google or AWS, you're going to use their, their Kubernetes their offering. Managed offering so. Yeah. Exactly. So that's going to take away a ton of pain. But yeah, I think it all comes down to like, when is it worth it for you as an organization to take that hit in the fact that you're going to have to relearn some things, you're going to have to change a lot about your workflows. Cool. And that question is going to be different for everybody. Like I mentioned, if you've got a group of six engineers and they're all Kubernetes experts, then go to Kubernetes. That's great. You know, it'll probably be fast for you. But if you've got a team that's used to using configuration management and VMs, then stick with that until it's a bottleneck. Like go with what you know, boring technology and boring build, technology always the worst. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Unless you have extremely novel problems, which thankfully most of us don't have. Right. Now, in a prior life, you know, you led platform teams at SoundCloud and PagerDuty. You now lead a platform team at Honeycomb. And, you know, these are internal teams whose mandate is to basically make other engineering teams mm -hmm. faster. What do you think are important considerations about, you know, spinning up or running a platform team? Yeah, that's a good question. Small correction, I don't lead the platform team at Honeycomb. I, In a previous life, I was a manager and I have since um, swung the pendulum back to being an individual contributor. So, ah. you know, we have a manager on the platform team who's kind of leads the team and whatnot, but I am, I am an engineer amongst many. In the past though, you know, you're right. I have been responsible for spinning up like you know, what could be called platform teams. They've all taken on different names and whatnot at various companies. It is really funny because platform is one of the most overloaded terms oh, yeah. on our chart. Right? I think actually like, you and I fought for the name platform team because I was on exactly. the external API team, which was also the company's platform externally. Exactly. Um, and you won and, and rightfully well, yeah. so because customers care that you're the platform that they were building on, right? The yeah. products that you were building were the platform that they were building on. And so I think we changed the name of the team I was working on at that time to core or something right, like the that, core team, like core services. Right. And I mean, this is the thing. So there's a few fun challenges, I think, when spinning up those teams internally. And I think they, they mostly are not technical, which most of the fun challenges in you know, people management and team management are. The first one that comes to mind for me is like making sure that your team really internalizes that they're going to be working on components where their customers are other engineers at the company. So there are two inherent truths that are a little difficult for some engineers to internalize. And not everyone's going to get this, but hopefully, you know, you have people who are well-prepared and, and happy to, to adopt this mindset. The first is that your customers external to the company do not care about the work you're doing. Yep. And that's a really, really hard pill to swallow sometimes because we all like to think, no, no, I mean, we have direct value and everything and you don't. So your job actually is to solve business problems with as little code or as little work as possible, because at the end of the day, it's the people writing the features that customers are, you know, loving to use that are really paying your, your salary. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that your work isn't important. It's actually critical. In many cases, depending on the team configuration, you could be taking on a lot a lot of responsibility for reliability and availability, making sure that the service is running smoothly, all of the things that the customer just assumes is gonna happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing that that implies is that you're gonna be building things and you're not gonna be the expert on those things. The people that you work with who use those systems are gonna know a lot more about them than you do, which is a really weird thing. But like, let's say you build, I don't know, some service that does like, you know, queuing or something like that, or queue management or something, you can do the best job you can do scoping out the use cases, scoping out the, you know, I've heard the term modalities used to describe like these types of things. 
But at the end of the day, you're, the other engineers in your company that are using this service, they're going to come to you with all sorts of surprising edge cases and all sorts of surprising ways that your service fails to meet their needs. And so they're going to learn more about it just through their use of it than you will in your designing of it. And that's kind of a humbling thing sometimes is, you know, writing something that will forever be disappointing some people. But it also allows you to, you know, there's an opportunity there where you can adopt a service mentality, like a customer service mentality, and really be excited about learning more about how people want to use your services. Yeah, it almost sounds like we just describing it is having a product mindset, right? But for an internal product that is, you know, developer components and libraries and systems for spinning up new infra. Exactly. Yeah. You, you are not, you know, doing your job if people hate using the stuff you're using or if they fail to adopt it entirely. And that's an all too common thing, unfortunately, with teams that create internal software. Let's say that you were to, I mean, you, you are now on the platform team at Honeycomb. If you were starting a brand new platform team today, what are some problem areas you would tackle first? Or what areas would you kind of think like, I've been burned here, there are dragons. Mm -hmm. That's a funny question because I'll, I'll give the, sounds like a cop-out answer, but I will elaborate on it. It depends. Um, <laughs> you know, it really depends on what business you're in. It depends on how you're delivering value. And I think I would figure out how, you know, your job, in my opinion, as a central platform team, as, you know, an internal tools team, whatever it is, like where your customers are other engineers at your company, your job is to accelerate, you know, value delivery. And that can mean, you know, like, let's say it's taking engineers a long time to get their code into production. That can mean working on, you know, CICD, or it can mean, you know, let's say engineers at your company who are working on product features are having difficulty with reliability. That can mean, you know, doing some investigative work, figuring out what the bottlenecks there are and abstracting away some of those things, or just making it easier for people to ship and build reliably. So yeah, it, it really does depend. It depends, like the first thing you need to do is get in and figure out what the actual problems that your engineers are facing are. And, and this sort of falls into the you know, view I've adopted that there are no best practices in our industry. There are only, you know, sets of like guidelines that you can kind of use to look for problems and, and try to evaluate problems with value in mind. You know, you don't know ahead of time what problems a company is having. And so you don't know what you can build or what team structure will work, or, you know, whether you even need a platform team. Like I've worked on teams where people just work cross-functionally and it works brilliantly without a central platform team, but that's not going to work everywhere. Right. One thing uh, that I think about, you know, when you have this platform team, you're building these components for the other teams you mentioned that, that build the actual features, right? And that ties a lot into this idea of like, you build it, you own it. Those teams that are building the features are ultimately, you know, end to end responsible for those features. And they use this, this componentry. What are some of the challenges you think that teams face as they, they adopt that mantra of you build it, you own it? Mm, that's a great question. Adopting that is a funny thing to me, because I've never, I've, I've been fortunate enough that I've never really worked in a place where engineers weren't on call for their code. You know, every place I've joined, that was so a, either... a strong selection bias then in your career. Arc. Absolutely. Absolutely. My career arc has included companies exclusively that did this. Now at some companies that was an intentional decision from the get go, like Honeycomb. I don't think anybody, you know, we've never had a culture where engineers were not on call for the code they write. In other companies, that was just a, a change made before I arrived. And so I sort of came in and they were already doing this. But I think, you know, if I can stretch my imagination a little, I think a few things will come to mind. You know, one is just the mentality that production is the only thing that matters. <laughs> and I think that gets really, that's hard not to have that mentality when you're on call for production code. You know, you realize that you can do all the testing in QA environments, you can do all the staging, all of the load testing and everything. But when you actually push to production, and that's when you learn what your service is going to be doing. I like to see feedback loops set up in place where engineers are then encouraged to either work with you know, a platform team or an infrastructure team or do it themselves if they have the bandwidth and planning to do this, but figure out ways that you can safely push things to production as quickly as possible. And what I mean by safely is like have more knobs, have more controls, you know, be able to like adopting feature flagging is like a thing that just once you own things in production, I don't think you can ever unsee using feature flags to right. be able to turn off things in production if they start to cause problems. You know, another one is like, like I said, improving the speed of your CI CD pipeline, right? You own this stuff. So you're watching it go out and you want it in production as quickly as possible, or at least a sampling of production. I think overall, it all comes down to like just overcoming challenges with the, the tightness of that feedback loop. Because if you're in an environment where you don't have that kind of ownership, just kind of throw it over a wall and forget, then the amount of time it sits over the wall, but not in customers' hands, isn't really your concern, which I think is damaging. But you know, yeah, that's what you get this sort of away diffusion of responsibility. It's nobody's concern then. It just kind of lingers and then some, some process occurs, but it, yeah, nobody's really driving it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Final question for you, Paul. Favorite beer? Ah, 
That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I don't have just one. I mean, that's impossible. Okay. To pick. It's, like, it's like, it's like, which of your children do you love the most? Exactly. You know, <laughs> you know I, I, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm a, I'm a fan of, you know what I, I'll say is as I've aged, I have become less and less a fan of IPAs. So I'll use the process of elimination. Yeah, yeah. I just find Too much like, hops. It's, it's this hilarious culture where somebody is like, oh, this tastes horrible. Try it. You know, <laughs> it's, that, that's um, alcohol in general. I remember as a teenager, this is terrible, but I want more. Right, right. Yeah. But with IPAs, it's especially like this will burn your tongue off and you'll never taste another thing again in your life. So <laughs> I've definitely become more of a fan of like very drinkable kind of like lagers and whatnot and ales. Cool. Well, Paul, listen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, once again, we have Paul Osmond from Honeycomb. Uh, I'm Ken Rose from Ops Level. And thanks again for everybody. Tune in next time.